Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, I am basically done with the two nominees for Best Novel at the Hugo Awards that I wanted to narrow it down, that I narrowed it down to in my earlier video. First, Leviathan Wakes. I listened to the audiobook on this one. And the second one is Among Others by Joe Walton. I'm about 80% done with that, but I've read enough to pass judgment. I'm going to finish the book, but I've read enough to really decide about what I want to vote for, or recommend that if you are a registered voter for the Hugos, that you vote for. So, let's start off with the first one I finished, Leviathan Wakes. This is basically, well, it's space opera. It's not a star-faring interstellar space opera like your Lensman, your Star Trek, your Star Wars, Bab 5, whatever. I could start listing off books all, uh, books and series all day. Um, it's not that. It is a, for lack of a better term, it is a solar space opera. It, it stays within the solar system. Um, the story starts out when a um ice hauler collecting and mining ice from the rings of Saturn receives a distress signal from a spacecraft. It comes to investigate and gets blown up with a small number of crew members surviving. They send their um, information that they have from their sensor records as part of their distress signal and point out that the evidence they have of who attacked them points towards the government of Mars, Mars and Earth and the for lack of a better term, the Rim, the, um, what's called the Belters, basically the colonists of various asteroid co colonies, each have their own little separate governments. Um, and the, so the Belters respond in, harshly and negatively, as you would expect, because they depend on asteroid miners and that sort of thing to have the water and air they need to survive. And similarly, um, Mars is upset because they assume they're being accused of an act of war, which apparently they did not do. So, this leads to the two plots of this, the A and B plot. A plot is the survivors of the attack on the uh, ship. The, um, what's the name of it again? The, um, okay, they don't nick the name of the ship. Uh, the, the derelict of the Scopuli, but the vessel that the survivors are from is not mentioned in the back cover. It's been a while. Um, anyway... They're um, trying to survive and try to avoid getting blown up and all of the problems they run into. We mean that there's a serious bit of the story where basically they don't end up on a ship that doesn't end up getting attacked at some point. They just I mean, they they just rarely get a breather. Uh, that's actually the bit, the good bit of their air of that a plot is it just keeps going. Um, the B plot involves a basically a police detective from one of the asteroid colonies um, Detective Miller and he's basically your 30 minute let's say 30 minutes away from retirement but he's, he's getting old he's a bit of a loose not quite, not quite a loose cannon but he's a bit of a um, he's a bit old fashioned uh, he's a bit gruff a bit tough but he's not but he's not quite the loose cannon cop in the way you suspect. He's not dirty hairy. He's not going to shoot a guy for looking at him funny or anything like that. He's not Popeye Doyle. He's not dirty or doesn't have the air of being dirty. He, in fact, he's probably more honest than some of the other people on the force. Um, but in his own separate way. He's still pragmatist. He's a, he's a... I'd almost compare him to... A Sam Spade style detective, where Sam Spade style detectives are pragmatic, but they have their own little degree of honor that they support and that they they root for. They, they have their own level of they they're in, have integrity. They have values which they want to uphold and would like to see 
indoor put this another way they're pragmatic people who don't want to be pragmatic they live in a heart they know they live in a harsh cynical dark world dark grim world which they like to see become better but they don't see how that could happen they don't expect they, they, they quietly dream of a happy ending but when they wake up they know they'll never they'll never get one not even a bittersweet they, they expect not even getting a bittersweet ending it's like living in Law and Order, in a Law and Order episode. There's, I guess, another good way of putting it. Um, so these two plots eventually intersect, but interesting seeing how they bounce between the two. Miller's plot is very much a detective story, and as someone who grew up reading detective stories, I appreciate getting a science fiction detective story. I've always enjoyed those, and enjoy how the people who write them kind of think do a good job of thinking ahead about, okay, here's what detective work is like, and here's how technological advancements moving ahead will both make detective work easier and harder, and, and kind of thinking about how that affects, well, crime solving. And so it it's, provides a good pacing breather from the A plot, which is bang, bang, bang. It is Stuff happens and goes bad. It's short breather, and then and then we get a big, let's say, an action set piece. Some of them involve action set pieces, but moments of extreme tension, and then things slow down and pace again. And it reminds me a lot of the movie version of Fellowship of the Ring. The book version it has this habit of stopping dead repeatedly. Uh, we get moments of tension, sort of followed by really slow periods. Where the movie it is just Lots of quick peaks and then valleys, where we have where everyone's always on the move, everyone's always on the run, and and everyone's being hunted. The hobbits, when they're fleeing from the Shire to Bree, have the Ringwraiths on their heels. When they go from and the Ringwraiths are still on their heels when they go from Bree to Rivendell. After they leave Rivendell, they don't have the run of the Ringwraiths, but now there's a, it's a matter of time. And once they get into Moria, there's a matter of that they're surrounded by enemies, and so forth and so on. So it's this level of constantly building tension, and whenever you think that things slow down, you get occasional moments of things slowing down, but you know that they're limited time, and once we get out of that, things are going to go badly, or things are going to get rough again. Um, and that's that's the A-plot. And, and all the characters in that A-plot, actually all the plots, are very well fleshed out. But in particular... Uh, Jim Holden, the XO of the uh, Ice Miner, who was in charge, ends up in charge of the survivors, is very good, is very well fleshed out in terms of. Whereas Detective Miller is a pragmat, is a pragmatist in a in a cynical world, who knows that idealism doesn't work or fears or, or feels like idealism doesn't work. Um, Holden's an idealist. He is a, he is basically the idea of his philosophy is well if we tell everyone everything we know then something will get done on the about this and people will make the right decisions when uh, or that sort of thing and it doesn't always work that way and this leads to my my prefer uh, my interesting little points about the book that I like is the book's also Aside from the A and B plots, the main conflicts here are is very cultural. Um, the book does a good job of setting that up. In that, the Belters are ultimately, whether they like it or not, insanely vulnerable. Every um, asteroid colony, it depends on Earth, Mars, and ice miners to survive. Um, any food supplies must come from Earth and, Earth and Mars. Um, the ice miners are the ones who provide them the drinking water, and no matter how much recycling systems they have, and no matter how good they are, they'll be lost, they'll be waste, um, and all this other sorts of stuff. It does a good job of painting an idea of what a life on an asteroid colony or a long-term space station would really be like. In ter something that even Babylon 5 didn't do get into, which kind of surprised me. Um, with, I mean, like, for example, air. We are on Earth. We have, we have fresh air, more or less, unless you're, like, living in, like, 
a really smoggy city. So you open the window, you get in fresh air, you don't necessarily are smelling, unless you're in like a confined space without good ventilation, you don't have to deal with, well, the smell of everybody else. You don't have to worry about your people's body odors and food odors and waste odors and all this other stuff. I don't just mean like, you know, bodily waste. I mean like, okay, garbage can waste. Um, all those sorts of stuff. And the book gets into that as far as like, you deal, as far as like, the air you, you, you like scented. And like, for like certain people, you can have like, okay, buy a scenting package for your, basically your ventilation system so that your house always smells like apples or chemically put together or like something that's chemically designed to smell like apples sort of or that sort of thing it it reminds me like how people describe um the middle ages and the renaissance and so forth as far as look at the renaissance is everybody's very heavily perfumed because people didn't bathe much or didn't or if they did they still perspired a great deal we don't have underarm deodorant like we have now where it eliminates odor you used perfumes and colognes and that sort of thing to mask your odor and all sorts of other stuff that just makes this interesting for us it's a it's a world it is a well put together world it is one of the best put together worlds i've seen done in science fiction this is as far as discs go i mean i have a page count on this this is like 16 compact discs about um, nine, about like 19 and a half hours. Um, by comparison, the, um, I've been listening to some of the Hyper of Hyperion by Dave Simmons. And honestly, Hyperion, in the amount of time I've listened to that book, I has done, hasn't done nearly as much as this does. It, yeah, it, Leviathan Wake's info dumps, but the info dumps are interesting because they are done from the perspective of the characters. They're not done by some third person omniscient narr narrator. They are done from Detective Miller, who's been born and raised in, astero in asteroids. He's a belter, and he gives the belter's mindset of, their lo of they are living on the raggedy edge, and you are a whole difference away from annihilation. And, and they feel that in the belt, that people from down the gravity well, like Earth and Mars, are very radically different philosophically from there, because, I mean, if you're living on Mars or on Earth, you can walk outside and see the sky. You have, it puts you in a very distinct mindset when you have the protection of an atmosphere, something that you don't have in an asteroid where, every, where you're always at risk from everything, and even a ship crashing into the space crashing into your asteroid because it's off course or its engines mess up or something can send you to total annihilation. It is just amazing. Um, if I give a minus to this, I'm, honest, I'm kind of an idealist. I am I have a lot in common philosophically with Holden, with Jim Holden. Um, and the book spends a lot of time basically beating the crap out of Holden psychologically for being too naive and being too idealistic and being too, um, well, I don't say goody two-shoes, but too willing to trust people. And because inadvertently, Holden's actions end up escalating things further and further. It does event um, eventually lead to... Um, to, to kind of a good solution, but it does, for a certain part of it, everything Holden does in an attempt to make things better ends up making things worse. I'm not going to try to go too much into spoilers here, but this is part of my main objection to the book is, I find the right way to phrase this, and I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I think the ultimate problem I have with this is it's kind of the attitude of um, Superman is dumb because he believes in truth and justice. Um, Batman is dumb because he doesn't kill the Joker. It's kind of those attitudes together, uh, combined together of, well, the ideal is the cynical, 
the pragmatic, the possibly logical viewpoint to do would be kill the Joker and it'd save us a whole lot of hassle and a lot of deaths in the future. Because, well, he's never going to be redeemed. He's going to get out and try and kill again. So obviously, taking the Joker out of the equation permanently is the best for all of Gotham and for possibly all of DC Universe's Earth. But on the other hand, well... Put it another way. Yes, I mean, the easy way, the pragmatic, cynical way is kill the Joker. But how does that make us better than him to a certain extent? Uh, if we're trying to make ourselves better than the villains, then why? Then we have to stop and go. Is yes, this is a pragmatic world, but maybe the pragmatic decisions aren't the best way to go. And as far as for the sake of our soul, for the souls, for lack of a better term. Um, interestingly, a movie I watched recently, the The Expendables, actually kind of takes this route. Um, Stallone's character and his team. Stallone is, is very much at the beginning these pragmatic, cynical guy. And basically, he gets, he gets talked into taking the idealist route uh, and saving the girl and letting her re um, and overthrowing the dictatorship and letting her rebuild her country in a way that is better because he basically is because basically um, Tool, the character played by I am freaking having brain farts today. Um, the character Tool um, tells him that, well, my, I kind of been doing this so long, my soul's dead. And I know that my soul died because he gives this antidote, which I don't want to spoil. It's a very well delivered scene in the film. Um, and, the, and then this kind of persuades um, Stallone's character to take action. It's great. It's a great scene. And it gives a character in a Stallone movie, in a homage to 80s action movies, which, if you've, depending on how many of them you've seen, you'll, you'll know, there's no emotional depth in those characters at all. It gives that character a moment of emotional depth, which is surprising and interesting. Um, and... I'm not, and I like it when we get this sort of most death where we have characters who are not afraid to be idealistic, characters who are not, who are not afraid to recognize that perhaps the most logical option at the time is not necessarily the most reasonable in certain respects. Um, but anyway, long story short, I enjoyed this book, and I'm definitely going to read the sequel when it comes out later this year. But. It's not the book I liked the best. The book I liked the best was Among Others. This is a book which has fantasy elements to it, and the first read the description I thought, well, this is a fantasy novel, right? Shouldn't this be with the World Fantasy Awards? Why is this with the science fiction? But then I read that the narrative of the story involves the character's love of science fiction and building friends among the science fiction fandom and so forth and so on. So it's, okay, I read it. I'll give this a shot. Well, Leviathan Wakes is a really, really good science fiction novel. It is, as far as within science fiction. You can be a good book and not be a good science fiction novel. And you can be a science fiction novel without saying, okay, this is a great work of... This isn't something where if you go too far outside of science fiction, people won't get into it. This is a book which is just generally overall an amazing book. Um, it is first person written in diary form. The main character's name is Morwenna. I don't know her last name. Um, she and there's some backstory in this which is slowly spelled out where she and her twin sister had a conflict with her mother involving magic, and her mother ended up killing her sister, and Morwenna ran away and is trying to use magic and other stuff to hide. And she's currently now going to a boarding school. Um, 
And through all this, she also, she reads science fiction, particularly because she, and particularly, partially this kind of as escapism, but also she likes the sort of different ideas that are expanded science fiction. She's, she is a true science, she is a science fiction fan, written by a author who understands science fiction fans. Um, because she is one, honestly, and she's writing science fiction. Joe Walton's written loads of science fiction before, and she'll no doubt write more in the future. Um, and this is a great book. This is a really great book. The character in Mortwena is well fleshed out. We talk, the rules of magic are spelled out fairly early on. They're simple enough that you don't forget them if you set the book down and pick it up again a week later because you're working on midterms. Um, but what makes this book, I think, great, it relates to... Um, actually an author who the main character more derides later on in the book not a spoiler here judy bloom i'll admit i haven't read any of judy bloom's stuff i know her work by reputation because when banned books month comes around i go and i hunt down the list of most banned books and read through it and i swear to god judy bloom it if you go not by number of Time, number of places a book has been banned, but not by number of individual works that have been banned or challenged. Judy Bloom would be like the number one most challenged author in the history of literature, at least within the United States. Because when she writes books about young women, or young people in general, she aims to be real. She has them dealing with real problems, real concerns, in a real fashion. Peer pressure, sexuality, puberty, that sort of thing. And she doesn't, like, go for weird um, metaphors and that sort of thing. When a character is dealing with menstruation, when a female character is dealing with menstruation in a book, she deals with menstruation. She doesn't develop psychic powers as a metaphor for menstruation. And in the book, Marwenna kind of derides Judy Bloom as being... What's the quote? I'm actually on. Mark, I'm on to mark this page so I can use the exact quote. Um, for one thing, they are so relentlessly downbeat, and despite that, you will know everyone will overcome all their problems in the end and start to grow up and understand how the world works. You can practically see the capitals. Um, I've read. I've read half a ton of Victorian children's books because we had them lying around at home. Elsie Dinsmore and Little Women and Eric, or Little by Little and what Katie did. They're by different authors, but they all share the same kind of moralizing. In the exact same way, these teen problem books share the same kind of moralizing, ex ex only it's neither so quaint nor nearly, s or, nor so clearly stated as in the Victorian ones. Oh, and one other bit. I'd rather take the two. If I have to have a book on how to overcome adversity, give me Pollyanna over Judy Bloom every day, though why I would read any of them when the world contains all this SF is beyond me. Even within books written for children, you can learn way more about growing up and ethical behavior from space hostages or citizen of the galaxy. Um, and I understand that attitude, but I think the difference between Judy Bloom is sometimes you don't want metaphor, you don't want simile, and I think that, she, that to a certain extent, I actually think Judy Bloom's stuff is pretty well, is pretty more directly stated, and it is, is directly stated, more directly stated than more thinks of it, but then again, I don't know how much of Judy Bloom that she's read either. Um, as far as the character goes. Because, I mean, normally, if a book is really subtle about the discussion of menstruation, masturbation, growing up, peer pressure, theft, um, social disobedience, war, or so forth and so on, if they're subtle, they tend not to get challenged, because the people challenging them tend to be idiots for lack of a better term. <laughs> In terms of all of the subtle metaphors and so forth go whoosh over their head, and so far over that there is no hair ruffling to clue you in that, the, that it went over their heads. Um, it is... It, so, actually, this, this book, I think, probably would fit in well into that category of Books that should be shelved in the YA department, um, along with Judy Bloom and so forth, but uh, but once they're put there, are just as likely to get challenged. Um, 
the character of Moore has, in addition to dealing with magic and so forth and so on, she has to de- she's ran away from home. She's had an abusive parent. Um, there's a scene where an adult character gets inebriated and tries to, well, sexually abuse her. And that's a situation which I think, in then of itself, probably get challenged. She talks about masturbation in a fashion that makes it clear that she has masturbated, but it's not done in an exploitive fashion or not described in a fashion that is meant to, well, titillate or anything like that. She talks about having sexual thoughts and all this other stuff. She, she, she's a real person. She's a real person who has, who has real thoughts about the world around here, about politics, about different cultures as far as like different religions. She's friends with, with a Jewish person, all, all surrounded with lots of people who tend to be more Anglican, with the relation to the UK, to, like, political stuff between, like, Wales, where she's from, and England and Scotland and so forth and so on. It talks about the Troubles a little bit. Not a lot, because it doesn't, can, doesn't relate to her situation. Um, death of a sibling. All this other sorts of, like, heavy stuff, which... But it does it in a fashion which doesn't beat you over the head with it in terms of unelegance. It's, it's recurring, these things are recurring themes, but it doesn't beat you over the head at this. It doesn't go, this is important stuff, you should be paying attention, wham, 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 wham. And cue the anvil. Um, the other bit is also alienation, social alienation. She is a person who... She's from Wales in a school that is mostly populated by English girls. She has a injury. She cannot walk without the aid of a cane, um, which also puts her in a separate separate from everyone else. So she can't she can't be necessarily be as much part of the overall population as everyone else. Um, from my experiences in public high schools, so it probably would be leading her to a certain degree of ridicule. They don't go too much into it. Um, and again, she is a geek in terms of she reads lots of science fiction. I mean, seriously, they're, the most disappointing thing about this book for me is at the back of the book, I checked, there is no list of bibliography, or there's no bibliography at the back of the book saying, here are all the science fiction novels that Morwenna reads over the course of this book. So I can't go. I am a photocopy of this before I turn it into the li- turn it back into the library, and then just go through this, check out the stuff I've read, and then mark everything else as to read on Goodreads. Because I want to do that. This is this book makes me feel inadequate about how well read I am as a science fiction fan, and yeah, I, I feel bad for not being re- being able to read science fiction as much and as often. Admittedly, this is. This is set during the late 70s and early 80s, and most science fiction books were about the size of, well, um, I showed you the cover of the first volume of Cities in Flight when I reviewed that. Most science fiction books tend to be around that size. You could, pro- I could probably go through, say, if I was really so inclined, I could go through Citizen of the Galaxy in about an afternoon, and in fact, in, high, in middle school, I'm pretty sure I did. Um, well, not Citizen of the Galaxy, Starman Jones. I, took, I read Starman, jo- Starman Jones in about a week. Most I would have read it faster if I had opp- more opportunities to just sit down and read it, or if I'd taken more opportunities just, to just marathon it. Um, so, anyway, as it is, though, which as far as which book I would go for, I think I'd go for more Among Others. It feels to me like a book where I enjoy Leviathan Wakes, but I can't go give it a universal recommendation to everybody. Among Others is a book where, honestly, I think... Phrase is the best way. I think this is New York Times bestseller list material. I don't mean this in some sort of sellout way. I mean, this is a book where if you got this into enough people's hands, I think they'd all enjoy it. I think if you went... I mean, if this gets a paperback edition, I think this could really take off. Um, be, as far as something more easy for people to carry around, I don't know. It's a an, it's an really, really good book. I do feel... Actually, I... All the Judy Bloom comparisons, again, 
caveat, I haven't read enough Judy Bloom. I really need to hunt down somebody I know who's read enough Judy Bloom and have them read this, and then get them on here to give a compare and contrast. Alternatively, if you have read this and you have read a lot of Judy Bloom, please feel free to post a video response or something in the comments explaining how I am totally on the money and I am right and brilliant in every possible way. And I am the most smartest man in the entire world is thingy. Or tell me how much of a of a pants on head idiot I am and I am totally wrong and my opinions are pointless and boundless. I mean, pointless and the idiocy of them is boundless, because goodness sakes, I haven't gotten any comments on these videos in forever, so I need to say something controversial to get you to comment on this thing. Um, anyway, so my pick, among others, I believe is my pick for best new novel, um, or best novel, in the 2012 Hugo Awards. Now, admittedly, later, I will probably find, come across some other book where I feel, oh, this book should have been nominated in place of something else, but that's um, a matter for another time. So that's done. Um, next week. Next week is E3. So I will be doing a bunch of videos after each press conference or after I've watched each press conference saying, this press conference was awesome. This press conference was dumb. Oh my God, Ubisoft brought back Mr. Caffeine. Someone needs to be shot. Something to that effect. And I'll be giving my thoughts on those. The Konami press conference is tonight. I won't be able to watch it live because I have D&D &D this evening. Um, some of the Saturday stuff, I might not be able to watch that day if there's anything on Saturday because I have... Oh, I and a bunch of friends will be going to hang out eating chili and watching all of the Alien movies. So that's Saturday. So anything on Saturday won't be getting covered by me. But I will... Even if I have to watch them after the fact, I will watch all the press briefings, I will give you my thoughts on them after I've watched them, and I will watch all the E3 coverage I can, and tell you later on, after it's over, my picks for best games of E3, and I'll see if there's something there that really merits shame of the show. Also, I'll really, really, I mean it this time, try to get that freaking... Call of Duty Let's Play going. I have the gameplay video recorded for every level of the game. I just need to record commentary on it and then get that up and running. But that's a matter to go later. So, until next time, I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next episode.